So good evening, everyone. Um, I'll uh, have a few minutes to present to you a project which is not part of the ENLT, but was actually started later on. Um, however, due to quite some similarities of the topic, I'm able and uh, happy also to present to you today what we are doing, and uh, have about 50 minutes to run through you to, to everything, so I'll, I'll skip up and uh, just go through it. So very briefly, I'll, I'll talk about the project aim that we're going for, about the research partners, introducing also the, the different topics uh, where these partners are working on to, and then because the cultivation of the algae in our project is working at our site, basically, so I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about this one. I have also brought some preliminary data just to give you an idea about it. It's not really like the project is still running. There's one more year of, of um, analysis going on and so on. So there's, please be patient. There will be more to come out of this. Um, so on one slide summary, uh, we are working on algae. We're working on um, sweetwater algae, and we're working on algae in photobioreactors. Uh, why we work on algae, I think I can skip this one today. This is all of you know. Um, but what we want to go to, or what we're doing for, is uh, um, work for it uh, in the means of uh, energy conversion, and here in the particular in the idea of working or converting algae into jet fuels. So this is basically the, the whole, the one major topic where the project is is all centered about. And um, so why about jet fuels? There was in the morning a nice presentation uh, where this was mentioned already, just to give you a few hints about it. Um, one is that there is no propulsion, propulsion alternatives uh, for aviation industry, particularly for jets, um, in vision at this time point. Um, at the same point, this results in that there is a, the, if you want to do something about sustainability, probably the solution would be to have alternative jet fuels and all of the concepts that we have for alternative fuels, meaning first and second generation of bike fuels, they usually don't target jet fuel at all. Why is this the case? So because jet fuel is a very um, like interesting compound or is highly defined, there's a lot of regulations going on through it. Uh, um, yeah, so from I think from, from a scientific point of view, it's a very interesting compound. If you look at it from a commercial point of view, um, it's the least expensive stream of all of them. However, if you look also into the future, the ideas or the, the, prog the, the prognosis are there that the area um, and the, the market for jet fuel is also increasing <coughs> just because the aviation industry is very unlikely to shrink with our current lifestyle. Uh, in the end, um, so there's ideas that with algae you can actually meet these requirements, and this is the, the second background of why you would do such a project. So one of them is have the algae, see how capable they are, and on the other side this is the marketplace, so which is kind of addressing you. So I would like to walk you now through a little bit through our value chain, um, saying like basically bit by bit by bit, which is actually addressing that. And I will start uh, here with the, with the algae cultivation. Um, so you'll see here some different bioreactors. I'll show them to you later again, so you have some ideas about it. Um, so basically, uh, the project, the idea was going back to 2010, and then initially it started in 2013, um, and will finish now, or finally next year. Um, and there was three um, systems uh, basically being concluded from companies in Germany that provide uh, bioreactors that were chosen <coughs> to, well, they also volunteer to participate. Um, so these three reactors were built uh, in, the, in the research center in Jülich, and uh, with the aim, what we're doing there is to produce a lipid-rich biomass. So the picture that you see here uh, kind of is, is um, lip nitrate stained uh, cells, so where you can look at the lipids. Uh, and this is basically our aim. So our aim locally is to produce in these different uh, bioreactors, biomass, that could be lipid rich and then will be further processed. So how is this further processing going? Uh, we were looking there at the extraction of the biomass, uh, particular um, in this project we're working uh, with extraction with um, solvents. Uh, so there's on one side there's an oil extract coming and then the, basically the remainders out of it is a lipid reduced or lipid free biomass. Um, partners and companies working on this one is, is um, Technical University of Krakos, BTU, um, and uh, the, the partners that are actually doing the extraction is a company called LTS, Advanced Station Schwedt. Um, yeah, and then we have Vano, which is also included. They focus on analysis and analytics of the oil extracts that are being produced in this. So I've already mentioned that we continue further to kerosene, so this is obviously the next step. 
um, the partners involved in this further processing is, is one foul as uh, refinery and uh, Technical University of Munich that do also investigation about catalyzators and um, modifications and changes needed there to process oil uh, on a sustainable and long term basis. And then we have the side screen here left. Uh, so we've heard today that the valorization uh, to methane is one of the points um, that is will act actively pursued and usually possible for any biomass, doesn't matter what you've done to it before. Um, in our case, the idea was to basically look at a complete energetic bio uh, valorization of the algae, and therefore this screen here goes to the kerosene, to the fuel, and then the side screen that goes all of it goes to methane usage. Um, partners that are involved in this one, this is Verbio, uh, in Germany, a uh, relatively or pretty large company working on, on biogas fermentation. Um, then with the digestate that is relieved out of this biogas project, there's uh, one company, uh, sorry, one university focusing on research on, on this, which is uh, Jakobs University. And then we're also looking in some side streams to, to possibilities that you can do with this lipid uh, or with this lipid free biomass uh, in general for using as material usage, so without burning it. And uh, the analysis here basically with the target looking toward proteins or sugars is done what is done by Adam Hagen University. So this is, well, there's actually one important part missing. Um, so about this major chain that I've mentioned, basically algae to kerosene and algae to, um, to methane, uh, there, this should be um, incorporated into a big uh, LCA, life cycle analysis, uh, to yeah, contribute there towards our current perception um, of what we can do with algae and how are algae performing um, yeah, outside of the laboratory or in, in the first small <coughs> stages. Yeah. So partners that are working on this and leading this analysis is, is uh, Airbus and the BBFZ uh, Deutsche Biomuster Forschung Center. So with this I would basically jump a little bit into this, uh, this first part here and, and uh, give you a to this one, um, and I started with the stuff that was uh, done at our site. Uh, so I've mentioned that we have uh, three different uh, PBRs being constructed there. So the idea there was that they're all phototrophic, um, they all have a footprint or photo reactor footprint of about 500 square meters, um, and they're sitting next to each other and uh, basically being there. <coughs> Uh, so we mentioned that we're looking into freshwater algae, so we basically concluded on organisms about um, Chlorella vulgaris, uh, or Chlorella vulgaris-like organism. Um, if you go more into detail into this, there's large differences, but they're all called Chlorella, and then some years later they might be reclassified and they're not Chlorella anymore. So, so there's an interesting field going on, but it's basically all about green um, algae um, originating from freshwater. Um, so the next step after building this and deciding the organism was to actually um, establish the, the scale up, and also there we need basically the whole supply chain from the micro petri dish uh, towards the uh, reactor running. Because in contrast, for example, to Nanoculopsis, this is an organism that not many people are working with, um, and that they are not so keen on providing you uh, with, the, with the inoculum. Um, so basically, we have to make sure there that we have this, which was mentioned before the chain. So if your culture actually crashes, that you can go to the shelf and take the next one have the next bag ready to start and, and work with your uh, inoculation. This also goes back to the point um, which I will show next, so that uh, we're working, uh, which was also mentioned today, that if you're working with these algae and you're looking into lipid-rich biomass, you actually need a nutrition depletion step, and that kind of automatically puts you into a, a batch uh, mode, so you'll grow your algae, you will have them limited, and then you'll harvest and then you start again for all these students and start and uh, start again with a with a new inoculum, at least to some extent. Okay, so coming finally to the uh, to the bioreactor. So here you see an, a nice sketchup that was drawn out of it afterwards. I've probably told you most of the parts about it by now. So what they all have the same is so they're all able to uh, have a temperature control. Um, they are supplementary CO2 available and um, they all have their own harvesting regime which also varies in between the, the reactors and what we're doing in this comparison also if you remember back to the LCA is that we're monitoring the different inputs streams so that to be able afterwards to say like how they were actually performing um, so differences between the different reactor concepts I've summarized here briefly um, one of them is a facility that <coughs> without the housing so from the there's standing 
there outside, which makes some things easier for some things for sure cheaper. On the other side, um, you have also some some drawbacks included. So the two other reactors basically work within uh, encasing housing included. Um, generally, algae cultivation is, is uh, well envisioned as like you have your your um, uh, culture. Uh, with the algae suspension and you bubble them or aerate them somehow uh, with, with the um, gas and with the, probably CO2. Uh, so this is the case for two of them, the fortified solution and for the Nova Green plant, the roughly classical algae cultivation, whereas the third plant is a bit different. Um, so there we have a, a closed environment, you have a CO2 enriched air and the algae are actually being sprayed um, over through the atmosphere and then dripping over nets through different layers until they will finally accumulate in the bottom and then you go back and circulate and circulate. So it's kind of an inverse system, so you bring the algae towards the CO2 instead of the other way around. It also gives you much higher densities, um, at least on the volumetric level, compared to, for example, the, the standard um, cultivations. And another difference that you'll see there is that the, the light um, path and light uh, exposure to algae is significantly different than from classical systems. Um, remote access, we have for two of these facilities, um, Enable, whereas the large one doesn't really have them. And uh, in contrast to this one and for the last one, we have uh, modularity. Um, if you come back to the idea, you need to go from this one milliliter to some cubic meters. You need some modularity in between to bridge these gaps and to actually go to the upscale. Um, probably interesting also is the volumes that, that we're handling with this. Uh, and this one is the lowest for the spraying reactor type. Uh, whereas the two other ones are significantly larger, there's a small difference in this uh, green type has actually a little bit more volume. All right, that was for the technical introduction. Now I'd like to actually go towards the cultivation and show you two examples here um, that are um, dating back to the summer. Um, and uh, I hope you will see something on the beamer, but I'll just talk about it in, in the meantime. So we started basically here on one day where we were inoculating, and you can see that there's a very light hint of, of, of green towards it, you can also see that the bags are not fully filled, so there's a, basically a small volume used to start the inoculation. Looking at the same culture two days later, um, we've significantly increased the volume, we've also significantly increased the OD, so there's a mm -hmm. growth going on. Um, we're looking at it and we say outside, if on good days, like if the algae are happy, as it was mentioned today, um, you have about one doubling a day, sometimes a little bit more. Um, so then we'll stay one, day three, day five, you'll see now that the culture gets more dense and, and stays like this over time. And if you're happy, you can see eventually the end that the color will change a little bit again. So I feel like the larger picture of it. So here you have a dark green culture. This is stood up to the state where they're roughly, well, they still have some nutrition and are very happy, and then afterwards they go into the limitation. Um, and uh, by this, then you see the effect of the stress and this color change. Why we do it? Because that's also the time when actually the lipids are being built up in this biomass, and then afterwards that's what we're looking forward to. So overall this patch was running for uh, 13 days, or was harvested after 13 days. From this module that we're looking into here, uh, we were harvesting about 2.5 kilograms uh, with a lipid content that was measured afterwards, about 60%. Now one more data that I wanted to show to you to this one is, is actually light exposure versus, versus OD that uh, was achieved, and in red, I'm sure you cannot read it, um, is, is the, the light exposure um, basically summed up uh, at by photons per day. Uh, and then here you see the OD how it's growing, and that will roughly also show the one over here. Maybe noticeable is that you've reached, uh, after about one week, you reach the kind of a plateau, and then afterwards you actually lose OD again. You also lose biomass if you're related to what's dry weight. But I'll show the next screen uh, about liquid accumulation. And this is about a different, or a a yeah, different batch one and a different reactor next to it. And what you'll see here is basically the end of the cultivation. Uh, also, we see here the nitrate staining of the <coughs> of culture suspension. So what you can kind of see is, is that they, we actually have nice chlorella cells, so they're all very nice and round. If you look at them under the fluorescence, uh, from the chlorophyll, you have these red pictures. And then at the very end, you see how they're getting stressed, and you see how these lipids are <coughs> accumulated. And then on the day after, the 17th was basically when we were harvesting. So in this case, also because the reactor size is significantly bigger, so we were harvesting about 15 kilos, and our lipid yield that was measured afterwards was about 23% uh, percent of lipids. So I have two more 
three more, and then I'm done. Yeah. Running through. It's okay. <laughs> so, so, so one of the things is comparison of the different directors. And uh, you might be able to see here that there's a green graph on top of all of these. <coughs> so we have, space, we have, we have uh, data loggers that measure the incident light activity of all the different reactors. Um, and, and you see that there's one which is significantly the highest one. And you can imagine it's the one that's outside that doesn't have the casing. So the two different reactors that have this casing are significantly lower with the incident light. I've summed it up also over this 30 day period. So if you set the reference to 100%, we use in the case of the foul <coughs> reactor, uh, this uh, foil, we use about 60% of the light. And in case of the Nova Green one, which has a glass house, but also has some photovoltaic modules included, we use in sum about 40% of the light. The last content slide before we go to, to <coughs> um, is uh, that uh, one of the partners that we're working with there, and that is also working in the or working directly connected to the cultivation downstream processing side solutions. Um, so what the crows have said, a lot of things, what they were looking into is to the harvesting process, is focusing on the two-step harvesting process first, on the filtration, concentration, and afterwards on the extraction. Also looking into different methods of how to optimize the extraction afterwards. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have questions for that one, basically uh, ask. And um, so, about the prospect, what we actually, what I would like to do for the for the last year. Um, so one of the things that we've done on most of the experiments, um, particularly for the cultivation, and then the rest of the time is being used to process this data further and to do the analysis, which uh, during this summer, for example, the work power was non-existent. So we're looking for this one now. Um, we're looking forward to produce some data about the data <coughs> that we get per area because I think this is one of the very significant data, even if it will lead to the conclusion that we might not do it for biofuels. Um, and kind of coming back to the event today, uh, so there we, there's a conference, or there's a national conference in Germany on algaes every year, and next year it will be held in Jülich, so at our site you will also be able to look at this, uh, about the sites and directors if you want to. Um, it will be in September, so just after the end of our project, so we're looking also forward there to introduce um, research from yeah, from all the different partners that I've mentioned today only and not basically spoken about. And with this, I would like to, well, sum it up. Um, so we're looking into a uh, state-of-the-art cultivation. What can we do with algae today or what can we not do? Um, I've introduced you to all the different partners and what we're doing. Uh, like I mentioned, I would like to say thank you to our funding agencies, uh, FNR and the, the Bundesministerium für Neon und Landwirtschaft. Um, to the partners that are all involved in, in this project, and then finally to our institute and to you for your attention. So, thank you very much.